Good morning. I would like to begin, of course, by thanking the conference organizers, uh, Muriel and, um, and uh, conference organizers uh, and Wolf for putting this together and inviting me to be here. Uh, I found it an extremely stimulating workshop so far. Lots of ideas and uh, the, the presentation today I hope will generate some questions and discussion that we can carry on also into the lunch hour. I chose this topic, uh, Hadean Earth versus the Origin of Life, to create some tension. Because there's a, there, there are a, a great number of uncertainties that exist in our understanding of the Hadean Earth that rival, in some respects, uh, uncertainties over the conditions and uh, syntheses and chemical reactions that are invoked in order to explain the fabulously complex biochemistry inherent in uh, any living system. Uh, my, uh, my list of beautiful affiliations here begins with the University of Colorado, but also my association with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, where I spend some time and the Earth Life Science Institute at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Now, recently we have uh, been awarded uh, a grant from the John Templeton Foundation, and we've established a new center called the Collaborative for Research in Origins, CREO. And if you'd like to learn more about that, and you, you may uh, send me an email or see me, uh, and uh, information about that is forthcoming. But to begin with, this is an interdisciplinary group. I came up with a short glossary of terms. I'm going to tell you about the Hadean. The Hadean is an eon. Earth has four eons. Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic. We're in the Phanerozoic right now, the last 542 million years. Well, the Hadean is the first eon. It's named after Hades which was a cold, mysterious place. It's not supposed to mean, necessarily, a molten slag heap. It is from about the time of the formation of the first solids in the solar system, at 4.56 billion years ago, as we heard about yesterday, to the beginning of the continuous rock record on the Earth at 3.85 billion years ago. I'll also tell you about something called oxygen fugacity, Oxygen fugacity you may have heard about, but it's a term that describes the theoretical partial pressure of oxygen in a system in the solid state. Another way to term that is it has nothing to do with oxygen. It's about stealing electrons and then what gases are, are in equilibrium with a mineral composition. Okay? Zircon I'm going to tell you about. Zircon is a mineral that is a zirconium orthosilicate. It's one of our best tools for analyzing the Hadean because this little mineral here uh, is forever. Diamonds are not forever. <laughs> no, diamonds, you, you can actually burn a diamond if you're nuts enough in a blast furnace. Zircon, on the other hand, is fabulously resistant to, to degradation. So even once it crystallizes, this thing is stable even in supercritical fluids. Uh, so it can go through several rock cycles. Granite is, uh, is a typical rock that you will hear about. I'm going to tell you something about it. But granite is really any rock that's got more than 10% quartz in it, and it has feldspar and other aluminosilicate minerals. This thing is is uh, a really interesting rock because it's less dense and it's thick and most people think that it's a unique feature of the Earth. Closure temperature is something that in a thermodynamic system, it's the temperature at which uh, that system is then closed to the universe and information can be retained. And it's important for minerals. And finally, chemical partitioning are rules that substitute elements from the environment into, say, a growing crystal lattice. So knowing these things, I'm going to tell you about the themes of this presentation today, because I'm going to tell you about three heresies. First, you like that? Good. You can burn at the stake with me, too. 
One is I'm going to tell you about the evolution of mantle redox state and what this means for the origin of life. Because an important feature of mantle oxygen fugacity is it can tell you something about the nature of the primary atmosphere. Second, I'll tell you the nature and timing of impact bombardments. Things that obviously would have effects on the nascent biosphere by thermal assaults. But which is more important? Getting beaten up or burned at the stake? I prefer to get beaten up. So I'm going to tell you about that. Then finally, I'll describe the crust, this is the granite part, as a platform for early life. I'll tell you something about its antiquity, volume, and complexity. So here's a little timeline. T0 here is what we heard a lot about yesterday. And T minus T0, right, is what we heard about in the pre-solar grains presentation by Lyons. And then T0 plus are presentations we heard, for instance, by uh, Willy Clay and, and Henning Hock. And so, but I'm going to talk to you about this time period over here, which heresy we now have a geological record of. People thought it was impossible, but I love to say, oh yeah, impossible. So I'm going to tell you about mantle redox evolution. But to begin with, I'm going to show you what the contemporary Earth's upper mantle looks like in redox. Now, this is the oxidized part of the mantle. Up here, it's the shallow mantle where the mid-ocean ridge basalt source is. It's got a log FO2, FMQ, which is priest talk in geology for phyllite magnetite quartz. That's the mineral buffer, right, that gives a contemporary oxygen fugacity of the mantle. But if you go a bit deeper into the mantle where graphite and diamond are present, oxygen fugacity is a bit lower, right? That's how we have diamond at all. And we have carbonatite melts and so on. So this is sort of a reduced region and this is an oxidized region. And well, the, the part that we sample here that gets degassed at mid-ocean ridges, but beneath the, about two kilometers beneath the waves here, is a, a gas mixture of CO2, nitrogen, water vapor, and a scotch of hydrogen and maybe a bit of methane. Hardly any. Now that is completely consistent with the so-called oxidized part of the mantle. It's not about oxygen, it's about stealing electrons, so oxidizing substances. Well, what's the history of this thing? Well, the evolution of this oxygen fugacity in Earth's silicate mantle is relevant to discussions like in this workshop because it, it, it uh, modulates the speciation and mobility of volatile elements in the interior and controls the degassing of species out of volcanoes. Now, that is something that's been true ever since the Earth's formation. Now, Walter Loeb in 1906 uh, explored this and it was subsequently explore, explored by Stanley Miller here and his, uh, his advisor Harold, Harold Urey uh, in uh, the early 1950s by using a so-called primitive atmosphere gas mixture which frankly was a bit of guesswork at the time, saying that the Earth's primitive atmosphere kind of looked like Jupiter's, something like methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water. We know that um, actually even at that time, geologists like Silane and W.W. W. Ruby foamed at the mouth when they saw this. They said this is, this is actually impossible to make using Earth's composition. Um, However, they were squashed because of the fantastic results of the Miller-Urey experiment. But since that time, vanadium-scandium ratios of rocks from Earth's mantle, as well as, uh, as chromium uh, analyses by people like John Delano and Cinti Lee and so on, have shown that at least for uh, the last three and a half billion years, Earth's mantle oxygen fugacity has been more or less the same as today's. Well, there's been some important recent progress with this. My uh, former student, uh, Dustin Trail, uh, came up with a new oxygen fugacity meter 
using Hadean zircons, that mineral that I mentioned before. So uh, Dustin came up with this idea that, you know, the sensitivity of rare earth element partitioning into the crystal lattice of, of zircon is a function of temperature as well as oxygen fugacity. In this case, he looked at cerium. Cerium is one of those rare earth elements that can be either plus three or plus four. Now it's oxidation, okay, will we'll determine how much cerium is in the crystal lattice. And Dustin published this in 2011, 29 analyses, showing that even back to about 4.3 billion years ago, the oxygen fugacity of melts, of mantle origin, leading to the crystallization of Hadean minerals, which people told us should not be there, but never tell nature what to do, were well within the oxygen fugacity of contemporary Earth. Well, that's interesting because if the, here's another example how the early Earth had some similarities to today. So for instance, we can, we can see that abyssal peridotite, like deep, deep rocks that are, are found in the seafloor and so on, relative to uh, another mineral buffer, iron vustite, you know, these things tend to be kind of oxidized. And if we increase this data set, uh, this is from a paper uh, John Olton, a student of mine, and I uh, have written and submitted. We've extended this database to rocks, other Hadean rocks from the Acasta Nice complex, and then from Nuvo-Agatuk and Isua and so on. And it shows there's, there's a bit of a jumping around here. This is fascinating because this shows some very oxidized components consistent with water alteration of these rocks in the Hadean crust, and very reduced components here, even well below iron vustite, consistent with the subduction of organic carbon. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit because we have direct evidence now that organic carbon was being subducted in the Hadean before the rock record. So we only have a mineral record. Well, what about other places like the moon? Well, it's long been known, at least from the Apollo program, that the moon, it's a smaller world. Its mantle is more reduced. And this is a key observation for people interested in the possibility of origin of life on exoplanets. Because the oxygen fugacity of a mantle is strongly determined not just by composition of the planet, but also its mass. Because the smaller a planet, the less partitioning you have from the disproportionation at the core mantle boundary of iron two into iron metal, which grows the core, and iron three, which is left behind to oxidize the mantle. Smaller worlds do that far less efficiently than larger worlds like Venus and Earth and a super Earth. So I make a prediction that every cosmochemically Earth-like planet that we will see if we ever get spectra of its atmosphere, we'll have an oxidized atmosphere, not a neutral or reducing atmosphere because of these partitioning laws. What about Mars? Mars is fascinating because Mars is that planet that we all look at and we've sent a, uh, an invasion fleet to. So Mars didn't invade us, we invaded Mars. And uh, while doing so, about two tons per year of Martian material falls to the Earth as Martian meteorites. Here's one that I think is perhaps the most important sample in our collection of the last two decades. This is NWA 7034, it's a Martian meteorite. It's a polymicked regolith breccia. That means it's surface rock crushed up, fused together on Mars, blasted off and landed in our laps. This is the sample that we always talk about in sample return from Mars. Uh, instead of costing, well, two billion dollars, this costs about one and a half thousand dollars to buy. This is a three, this is about three centimeters across. What's amazing about this rock, it's got fine grain material and it basaltic pieces, bits of glass, and it has granitic clasts in it. Pieces of almost granitic-like rock that include zircon, which is a kind of mineral that you usually find in granites. These zircons 
I've measured them myself. I have this sample. Uh, the oldest one that we have found, and Munir uh, Humayun reported this uh, th three years ago, is 4.428 billion years. Well, that's fantastic. What's the oxygen fugacity? Uh, where's Uve? Oh, uh, there you are. What's going to be, what's the oxygen fugacity of Mars's mantle after what I just said? Lower or higher than Earth's mantle? Now you see, and now you know what it feels like. <laughs> Mars's mantle is down here because it's smaller, right? Oh, I've been waiting for that. <laughs> so Mars, Mars has a lower oxygen fugacity. Well, this is great because uh, atmospheric chemists have told us that one way to warm Mars is if its mantle was a lower oxidation state so that you could put more uh, uh, greenhouse gases like methane and hydrogen into its early atmosphere. There it is. Okay. So now, if I borrow some stuff from my friend Mark Hirschman and, and uh, the, the Bayreuth group, Dan Frost here in McCabin, I can plot Mars here on this speciation diagram of gases erupting from Martian volcanoes 4.428 billion years ago. Well, water is up there, but so is hydrogen, right? And a bit of methane. You compare that to, to Earth. Earth here is, is, uh, is really uh, poor in any of those reducing gases at any time. Now, that is uh, very interesting because we can make an analysis of the ages of these zircons and their mantle oxygen fugacity and say, look, the oldest terrestrial zircon in 210,000 analyses of one outcrop in Western Australia is 4.38 billion years old. There it is. John Valley talked about this two years ago. The oldest Martian zircon is 4.43 billion years, a bit older. It's from this rock. The oldest lunar zircon out of 300 uh, that we've analyzed is 4.4 billion. Sasha Nemshin saw the same thing. So here's the moon, here's Mars, Earth. It's starting to piece together. So this is telling us something about the primordial atmospheres of these bodies. Now I'm going to tell you something completely different. This is the Edwin Smith papyrus. It was attributed to Imhotep, who was an architect and a physician who lived in the old kingdom of Egypt. Now what if you were studying this document and then you turned a page and you saw that? You would think, okay, you know, I'm hallucinating. This is insane. This is a fragment of the so-called Madrid Codex. It's one of the three authentic surviving pre-Columbian Mayan books. It's a bit younger, right? But if you saw that in there, you'd think, you know, my mind is playing tricks on me. It turns out that fragments of granite have been found in meteorites. Uh, asteroidal granite-like magmatism, 4.53 billion years ago, tracheandesides, granite, a planetary point of view, to Cosmochemists and geologists and meteoriticists, this is one of those things, kind of like what Karen was mentioning, that astronomers were seeing these objects for years and years and oh, just noted it, oh, it's a curiosity. But for people like us in our business, this is the Mayan codex fragment in that hieroglyphic manuscript. This is why should a rock like this, Adzi Bogdo, which fell in 1949, it's an LL3 chondrite. It's a chondritic meteorite. This is one of the most primitive objects in the solar system, and it has a piece of granite in it. This is a 100 micron scale bar. This is from Adi Bischoff's work. This is ilmenite, pyroxene, whitlockite, which is a kind of phosphate, orthoclase feldspar, and quartz. <coughs> Remember I told you that's what you need to make granite? Well, the weighted uh, mean average age of these fragments here is 4.533 billion. And yes, we are measuring D-to-H ratios. 
of this thing in the, in the appetites here, the Whitlock height and appetite. And we already have the age, and we know the oxygen isotopic composition of these fragments here. It's not of the Earth, it's not from Mars. It, we think it's from a destroyed planetary embryo. At one time, the solar system had tens or perhaps twenties of planetary embryos the size of Mars, which had crust, atmosphere, hydrosphere, recycling the crust with dynamos, differentiated objects that merged. Some of them made bigger planets like the Earth, Others were destroyed fragments incorporated into primitive meteorites. For someone like me, this is the frontier, the first 50 million years of the solar system. So putting aside any highly reduced global geochemical scenarios like Miller-Urey actually leads to the RNA world hypothesis for people like me. Because prebiotic chemistry, synthesis of biomolecules, everything here from Gerald Joyce's little figure, I think Martins showed this yesterday, right? One of the speakers. Well, I think that all of this is guesswork. Let's just erase that. All of this can be squashed into the first tens or hundreds of millions of years of the solar system from direct analysis of samples. This idea is geochemically compelling for a number of reasons. Yeah, uh, Balukhani's talk, Gogarten's talk, and Lane's talk touched on all of these things. We now have samples. How about bombardment? I told you that, at least from the point of view of the Earth, never had a reducing atmosphere. Well, what about even if you've had the origin of life, all of these marks on the surface of the moon, here's Imbrium, right, or Mars, or in this case, uh, Ceres. Well, most of the moon's geology is related directly or indirectly to 50 big impacts starting from South Pole Aiken here at the back of the moon, which is a huge impact, and ending with Oriental, the last lunar basin discovered by Bill Hartman in 1964 or 5. Lunar chronology is here. If it hit the moon, it has at least a 20 times greater chance of hitting the Earth, upwards of 80 times greater, because Earth is larger. It's a larger tar target. It should have gotten hit. But the bombardment of the moon is confusing. And it begins with Apollo 12, 14, 15, 16 samples analyzed by the Lunatic Asylum, which is what they really called themselves, uh, by Fuadtera and Jerry Wasserberg and Dmitry Papanastasio. Well, those people and Grenville Turner, who also looked at Luna 20 samples for uh, 4039 Argon, notice something weird, that these samples all seem to show ages of about 3.92, 3.95, 3.98. And they came up with two possibilities to explain this. Two, all right? One is that what we're seeing is a decline here and a pass-through closure temperature. And so the last time information could be retained was the last time the, the, the flux was very strong enough to reset anything. And then after that, it weakened. Or it was a cataclysm. The cataclysm view took off, and it became derriguer. You know, this is, this is sexy. But then it made people, like my friend Graham Ryder, talk about a, a late heavy bombardment here. And you heard about this from uh, Gogarten's talk yesterday. But this is biological guesswork. There's a, no physics in this diagram whatsoever. And that's where bombardment and crater statistics come in to help us understand, well, really, was there just a monotonic or exponential decline? Or was there a bump like this uh, drawn with you know, a French curve? Well, Stephanie Werner uh, uh, in Norway has analyzed crater statistics as well or better than anybody else. And this is uh, back to uh, Hickenbach's talk uh, uh, today, you know, the size distribution power index over here. This is another way of looking at this. Here's crater frequency or numbers 
per square kilometer against size, five minutes, okay? So you notice, I think immediately, there's a change in slope from here, power index minus two at the small sizes, and a change in slope here from to minus four at big sizes. That is important, that's very important, because this bombardment model cannot be right. It can't be, because there are two power laws working for different sources of different sizes striking the surface of the moon, and therefore of different ages. So this is Neukamen-Ivanov's 1994 power law, where it says number of 20 kilometer craters per square kilometer per billion years versus an age here, and there's this decline here. High flux early on, low flux later. Well, the bombardment model, the smooth exponential decline of the decay, de decay flux of the, of the impacts is based on crater counting, and if you want to add Ryder at all, that's what it looks like, the classical LHB there. Karen showed us this morning this thing called the Nice model. In, in a nutshell, the Nice model is where you have a compact original configuration of the giant planets here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Jupiter and Saturn get into a two to one mean motion resonance with one another relatively late in solar system history. Saturn has a more eccentric orbit. It pumps the eccentricity of Uranus and Neptune, and they scatter the outer disk of planetesimals. In this scenario, Earth accretes another one times 10 to the minus three percent of its mass. Not oceans, no. No, no, no. None of our water, none of our volatiles came from the late heavy bombardment. All of that is very early primordial. Well, that's important because we can calculate, based on this dynamical model, the amount of material delivered to the Earth. And in this bombardment model here, Morbidelli revisited it and he used what's known as a sawtooth to explain this bombardment set at 4.1 billion years. But here's the deal. That could be at any possible time scale. That's very, very important. So what really matters is when all of this started. So the bombardment of the moon, I told you, could be cataclysmic or a function of closure temperature. Well, 4039 argon geochronology expanded shows that there's a peak earlier than that 3.95 that I told you about. Right there at 4.25. We see it elsewhere. We see it in the Vestoids. 4.25, 3.95 comes later. Now, Marky et al. argued that there are few reset ages at 4.2, but this is not, however, what we actually see. These diagrams, they drive me crazy because the sum of the probability here is a function of the bin size. So you can make the bin size big and curves go away. If you make them small, they reappear. So if this is true at 4.1, maybe this should be 4.25 for the beginning of the bombardment. Well, here's a paper that's in review right now. It's long been known that reset ages at 4.25 are found everywhere in the meteorite record. For instance, here, 4.25, here in LL chondrites, 4.25 in HEDs, 4.2 in brecciated HEDs. So all this shows is that the bombardment, at least in the asteroids, started earlier than 3.9. Well, it's also found on the moon. Here's a paper we published last year, Contributions. The, the zircons, which are the most resistant to resetting with the highest closure temperature, all show a prominent peak of reset ages at 4.25. It's the early heavy bombardment. Here's the preferred model. It's not the exponential decline. It's not the sawtooth, it's this. At 4.25, a Nice-like migration. Comets are the first to be scattered. They have a power law, minus four. They decay rapidly, and they're taken over by the asteroids, power law, minus two. 
There should be a dominant cometary contribution at the start of the early heavy bombardment, something that we see in noble gases in Earth's atmosphere. Well, is that a good place to live? Hell yeah! If you're a microbe, you want to live in a place that every once in a while, hot rock is in contact with liquid water in a hydrothermal system. Well, we've run millions of, of simulations of impacts of the surface of, of planets like the Earth and Mars. And we have found, using analytical tools and even gaming computers like this one, that we can run these simulations here for Earth at extreme bombardments, at baseline bombardments, and calculate how much bombardment is necessary to melt the entire crust. The, the late heavy bombardment was not even 3% there. In order to melt the entire crust, you have to have one and a half thousand times the late heavy bombardment under any size frequency distribution. We've done the same thing for Mars. Here's our recent paper. You can download it from my website. Indeed, Mars, the habitable volume of Mars's crust increases by a factor of 10 to the 5 by bombardment. Early heavy bombardments are conducive to the origin of life. So in synthesis of this bombardment, that meteorite groups and, and so on show that the bombardment began more like 4.2 billion years ago and with a protracted tail past 3.9. Well, in talking over here at uh, coffee hour, I was asked, well, how much ET material could have been delivered during this bombardment? Life essential elements delivered by bombardment could have been substantial. So uh, I calculated that just for phosphorus, about 3,000 biospheres of phosphorus. So not much water, but it could have juiced the ocean. So this is something that we're looking for. I know I'm a little bit over time, but I wanted to tell you one last thing, okay? When did this crustal platform for life appear? And I'm going to skip through the isotope systems and get to the gist. There. Crust recycling began as far back as we can go in the geological record. This figure shows mantle evolution against crustal evolution. Each of these blobs here, this is from a paper by Martin Guitoul, each of these blobs here show supercontinental assembly and generation of granite crust. This here indicates something like 5% present continental volume was present in the Hadean. So that means that a conceptual model of the Hadean Earth is not a planet that's covered in oceans, but it's a planet where rocks are affected by water that leads to formation of dry land. Now, I'm going to get to this. This is a spectacular result. This is from Beth Ann Bell's work. These are graphite grains in Hadean zircons, 4.1 billion. These Hadean zircons with the graphite have uh, oxygen fugacity values well below iron vustite, consistent with subduction of carbon in the Hadean. The carbon isotopic compositions of these things are minus 25, pretty consistent with other organic carbon values. Continental volume estimates, 5% continental volume may not seem like a lot, but it's something like 90% of Australia. So if you cut up Australia, distribute it over the surface of the earth, it's highly likely that emergent land existed in the Hadean. So to conclude, the first habitats for life could have been a mere 50 to 100 million years after solar system formation. Heresy. Cosmochemically Earth-like planets tend to have oxidized mantles. Liquid water is primordial to the Earth. Only magma ocean forming events matter in the historical continuity of the biosphere. Otherwise, the biosphere doesn't care what happens at the top. It just lives deep in crustal rocks and sediments. Planets form hot and disequilibrium is maintained over geological timescales by planetary oxidation redux coupling. 
Thank you very much for your attention. I know it was a lot of material, and I look forward to discussion.